Hello, and welcome to Distant Echoes, Episode 7, New Mexico 7, Cow's Head. Last time we summarized the state of New Mexico as it began to emerge from the foggy depths of prehistory. This time, we'll get into some of the earliest adventures to come to New Mexico. There will be maps on the website that will be updated as we talk about these early explorers that are linked in the show notes. While there were probably others before Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, mostly Spanish slavers, he was the first to put his name to being a European to travel through what would become New Mexico. We'll start with his background, the background to the expedition and its leader, and then get into the first half of the expedition. Cabeza de Vaca's title has a bit of a curious story behind it. To oversimplify the story, in 1212, a peasant named Alaja left a cow's skull to mark an undefended mountain pass through the Sierra Morenas in southern Spain. Using this pass, the Moors were defeated by the Spanish in the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa. King Sancho of Navarra created the title of Cabeza de Vaca and gave it to Alaja. From this, Cabeza de Vaca's mother, Doña Teresa, would inherit the title. Born in 1490 in the Andalusian town of Jerez, a town near the port city of Cadiz, Cabeza de Vaca would adopt his mother's title instead of his father's arguably more prestigious title of de Vera, which was related to the Spanish conquest of the Canary Islands. Cadiz was a fairly well-traveled port. Magellan would set sail from there, and Columbus would be brought back to this port after his arrest. In his teens, following the tradition among the gentry, he enlisted for a military career. In 1511, he was sent to Italy, where he would see action in the Battle of Ravenna. He would then serve as an ensign outside of Naples before his return to Spain. He would survive the Cumanero Civil War, the Battle of Tordesillas, the Battle of Vellelar, and fight the French in the region of Navarra. By 1527, he was a veteran of some distinction. At the time, the Spanish were preparing to colonize Florida in the Panfilo de Narvaez expedition. Cabeza de Vaca was able to secure an appointment as second-in-command for this expedition. The goal of the Narvaez expedition was to set up a colony on the coast of Florida. Let's talk a bit about the background to the expedition and the man chosen to lead this expedition. Narvaez was one of Cortez's original rivals in the conquest of Mexico. At one point, he had ended up imprisoned at Cortez's hands. He had been governor of Cuba for a time as well. He was most likely chosen due to the former as a way to try and check Cortez's growing influence instead of giving it to one of Cortez's men, something we'll see with similar expeditions in the near future. Narvaez was given a, the royal charter to conquer Florida for the Spanish crown. To reap the spoils of establishing the colony, he had to establish at least two towns of 100 settlers each and return one-fifth of all profits to the crown, known as the Royal Fifth. Cabeza de Vaca was chosen as a second-in-command. Two things of note about Spanish expeditions during this period. They still thought that they were on the fringes of Asia and not a brand new continent, and they did not have an understanding of the currents of the Gulf of Mexico, leading them to underestimate the distance between the northernmost Spanish outposts and the coast of Florida. Anyway, back to Cabeza de Vaca. It is possible before he set sail that he married, but it is also possible that this marriage was postponed until his return. I want to say that the translation I used for these episodes does note that all dates are roughly 10 days later than they actually occurred. Outside of direct quotes, I have corrected the dates. There are a lot of names mentioned only a handful of times in Cabeza de Vaca's narrative, such as the Han or Copiques tribes. He stayed with on Galveston Island, or Alvaro Fernandez, one of the members of the expedition. As most of them are only relevant to our story, insofar as Cabeza de Vaca's brief encounters, and to avoid confusion, I have decided to omit these names where I found appropriate. They left Spain on June 17, 1527, for the island of Santo Domingo, arriving around September 5th. During their time preparing in Santo Domingo, they lost 140 men before continuing on to Santiago de Cuba to resupply. From there, Cabeza de Vaca and some men would be sent to the port of Trinidad, as Narvaez had been promised supplies from the people there. During this time, Narvaez would stay behind. During this side trip, a tropical storm would strike the West Indies. Cabeza de Vaca given the following account, starting an hour after he left his ships to get mass af- at the church, after much insistence from the locals. Quote, An hour after I left, the sea began to rise ominously, and the north wind blow so violently that the two boats would not have dared come near land, even if the headwinds had not already made landing impossible. All hands labored severely under a heavy fall of water, that entire day and until dark on Sunday. By then the rain and tempest had stepped up until there was as much agitation in the town as at sea. All the houses and churches went down. We had to walk seven or eight together, locking arms to keep from being blown away. Walking in the woods gave us as much fear as the tumbling houses, for the trees were falling too, and could have killed us. We wandered all night in this raging tempest without finding any place we could linger as long as a half an hour in safety. Particularly from midnight on, we heard a great roaring and the sound of many voices, of little bells, also flutes, tambourines, and other instruments, most of which lasted till morning, when the storm ceased. Nothing so terrible as had been seen in these parts before. I drew up an authenticated account of it and sent it back to your majesty. 
As a result of this storm, 60 men and the provisions he had been sent to acquire were lost. The two ships Cabeza de Vaca had been sent with were both lost. Some of the men lost were found lodged in some treetops about three quarters of a mile inland. This is also the first recorded account of a West Indies hurricane. On October 26th, Cabeza de Vaca managed to acquire four more ships from the governor of Cuba and sailed to the port of Hagua. There he would remain until Fe February 10th, 1528. Upon his arrival, he would meet up with Narvaez, who had picked up a pilot who claimed to know the waters in the area around Florida. Narvaez had also purchased another vessel this time, which he had left in Havana. They quickly set sail for the mainland. Immediately, however, they ran into trouble when they got beached on a shoal off the coast of Cuba and were stuck for 15 days until a storm finally raised the water level enough to allow for them to continue sailing. They sighted land on April 2nd. On April 4th, they came to anchor in a bay, perhaps Sarasota. The comptroller, Alonso Enriquez, ventured to an island in the bay to trade with the Indians in the area. The next day, the Spanish made landfall and found the village they had traded with, which had been deserted the night before. The next day, quote, the governor raised flags and took possession of the country in your majesty's name, end quote. The men in surviving horses were also brought ashore after this. Cabeza de Vaca notes the condition of the surviving horses, quote, these were, few were too thin and run down to be of much use, end quote. The villagers soon returned, and despite the lack of a translator, they made it obvious they wanted the Spanish to leave, but they did not interfere any further. Narvaez then decided to continue exploring, taking a group of 40 men with him. During this trip, they may have discovered Tampa Bay and returned the next day. The brig with the expedition was sent back to Cuba while the pilot was instructed to find a harbor that he supposedly knew about with a different ship. They could not find this elusive harbor. They were to return to Cuba to join the brig and bring back additional supplies. They continued to explore and discovered another village. This village had Castilian-made boxes with European bodies in them. The expedition had the boxes burned as it was, quote, idolatry, end quote. They also learned that a certain Apalachee tribe had much gold and other precious materials. They stayed here for several days. On April 20th, Narvaez called his leadership together to express his desire to explore with a party further inland to find this Apalachee tribe, while the ships were to meet them nearby, once again at this elusive harbor. Before I get into how Devaka portrays this event, I want to note that for most of this stuff, we only have Devaka's account or the account of the joint report written by Devaka and two of the other survivors. So when Devaka seems to have some foreknowledge of what was going to happen, it may be a bit too convenient. Either way, Devaka gives his response as such. Quote, It seemed to me, I answered, that under no circumstances should we forsake the ships before they rested in a secure harbor which we controlled. That the pilots, after all, disagreed among themselves on every particular, and did not so much as know where we then were, that we would be deprived of our horses in case we needed them, that we could anticipate no satisfactory communication with the Indians, having no interpreter, as we entered an unknown country, and that we did not have supplies to sustain a march we knew not where, no more than a pound of biscuit and a pound of bacon per man being possible from the ship's stores. I concluded that we had better re-embark and look for a harbor and soil better suited to settle since what we had so far seen was the most desert and poor that had ever been discovered in that region, end quote. According to Devaka, other leaders gave varied responses, but Narvaez was determined to go on anyway. He offered to let Devaka stay with the ships. He declined, saying that if it went wrong, he did not want his loyalty questioned, and that he did not think the two groups would meet again. 300 men would set out with Narvaez inland, with little food to begin with. They'd find no one and little to eat on their march. They finally met a group of people when they crossed the Suwannee River. For some reason, they thought these people were hostile. The Vaca does not give the details on why, but they set upon them anyway and captured some and forced these men to guide them to their village so the Spanish could resupply, and they spent three days recovering. It is possible that Cabeza de Vaca does not give the details because at this point the Spanish were stealing from native villages to survive, which would have been frowned upon. From there, the leadership entreated Narvaez to begin looking for the sea. De Vaca, Captain Alonso de Castillo, and 40 men would set out in search of the sea to scout the nearby area. They would find little better places to cross the Suwannee than where they had originally crossed. They'd bring this news back to Narvaez. Another group would be sent to find the sea and would return a few days later. From here they set out to the sea, seeing no other people until June 7th. Again, my translation of Cabeza de Vaca's Relacion has dates that are off by 10 days. So when he says on the 17th, he really means June 7th. De Vaca gives a great description of the encounter. Quote, then on this 17th, there appeared in front of us a chief in a painted deerskin, riding on the back of another Indian. Musicians playing reed flutes walking before, and a train of many subjects attending him. End quote. This chief would note that his people were enemies of the Apalachee, that the Spanish sought and would assist them. At this point, the Spanish would reward him with gifts. When trying to cross the Apachicola River, one man, Juan Velasquez, would drown. 
The Spanish would spend the night in the village belonging to this chief. During the night, one Spaniard would be attacked and the villagers would flee. The next day, they continued onwards and arrived at the village of the Apalachi. Narvaez would order 50 men and 9 horsemen to attack the village. However, they did not encounter any men, only women and boys who immediately attacked. At this point in his narrative, Devaca mentions the plentiful game. It makes someone wonder as to why they weren't hunting to survive. Maybe they were and just weren't getting enough food. A few days later, the men of the village would return and ask for the captives to be released. The Spanish agreed for all but a captured cacique, what the Spanish called a Native American tribal leader and comes from the Tayano word for chief. This would backfire and the natives would respond with violence. This would be the start of a 25-day long guerrilla campaign. During this time, they learned of another village, Aute, and set out for that, facing hit-and-run attacks the entire time, and several more men would die. When they arrived at Ayute, they would find the village burned to the ground, although some food was left behind. From there, Narvaez sent Devaca to find the coast. By the time he returned, he found that sickness was spreading through the men. My translation speculates that it may have been dysentery and or maybe malaria. Despite this, they continued onwards, but due to the number of sick men, they were unable to make much progress. At this juncture, they decided to build barges and take to the sea to try and get to more favorable territory, thinking the Spanish were much closer than they really were. As a reminder, at this point in time, the Spanish didn't really have a good idea of where Florida was in relation to their other colonies. They began converting tools, stirrups, any metal they had on them into nails for the rafts, basically sacrificing what little military advantages they had over the locals to try and survive. For food, they took what they could from the village of Ayute, which was still nearby, and killed their horses every third day to feed the sick. They also turned the horse hides into containers for fresh water. By September 12th, they embarked on five barges and sailed for five days before landing on an island, after sighting a group heading for it. This island could have been St. Vincent's off the coast of Florida, where they found food before continuing onwards. Those hide containers began to rot, and this expedition quickly ran out of water. They landed on another island, hoping to find water, and found none. Due to a set of storms, they were stuck here for four days during which some men resorted to drinking salt water, despite the fact it would not hydrate them. On the fifth day, they made a decision. They could take their chances in the storm, or they could die of dehydration on the island. They chose the former. From here, they ended up off the coast, perhaps Pensacola. They found friendly people that gave them water in pots. However, while resting that night, they were attacked again by these same supposedly friendly people. Although they were able to successfully fend them off, they were stuck here for a time due to a storm before setting off. This time, they made it up towards Mobile Bay where they encountered another group of people. Two men were selected to go with the natives to get water, while some of the natives were kept as hostages. Upon their return, the two Spanish hostages had disappeared, and the pots were gone. While the, while the native hostages tried to escape, the Spanish managed to hold on to them, but they were forced to go onwards. There's no note of what actually happened to these two native hostages after this event, either. I do want to talk about the two Spaniards that went with the natives at this point. It is possible that they actually abandoned the expedition, and were not killed as Cabeza de Vaca speculates. Based on information gathered during the later De Soto expedition to Florida, it is claimed that for a time these Spaniards lived with this group. The barges continued onwards to the Mississippi, where they were able to get water. They tried to sail up that great river, but failed and were forced to continue onwards, the river causing the barges to get separated. Upon sighting two other barges, he recognized one as Narvaez's and caught up with it. From Devaca, quote, He asked me what I thought we should do. I said, On to the barge ahead. By no means abandon her, so that three might go where God willed together. He said that could not be done. The lead barge was too far out to sea, and he wanted to get to shore. If I wished to follow him, he continued, I should order my men to the oars, since only by arm work could the land be gained. His old cohort, Captain Pantoja, had advised him thus. Pantoja claimed that if we did not make landfall that day, we would not in six more, by which time we would have starved. The governor's will clearly divulged, I took up my oar and all my men theirs, and we rode till nearly sunset. But the governor, having the healthiest and strongest men in his barge, we could not keep up. I yelled to him to throw me a rope so we could stay with him. He called back that if he were to do what he hoped that night, he must not further sap his men's strength. I said that since we were too feeble to carry out his orders to follow him, he must tell me how he would, that I should act. He replied that it was no longer a time when one should command another, that each must do as he thought was best to save himself, that that was what he was doing now. So saying, he pulled away in his barge. Again, Cabeza de Vaca is our only source of this event. May not have quite gone down like this. De Vaca seems to paint a fairly negative picture of Narvaez throughout the account, which may not be entirely true. Usually he does this by claiming the governor's subordinates advised him to make these bad decisions. As Narvaez would disappear shortly after this event, we really don't have any counter-arguments to how these events went down. With that, de Vaca went to meet up with the other barge. The cohesion of the group had begun to break down. During a storm, he, this other barge would be lost to Devaca, and they would have to continue on alone. 
Devaka writes about how cold and weak the men had become at this point, and they thought death was certain. On around October 17th, maybe up to a week earlier, they arrived at Galveston Island. They quickly sent out a scout who found some food and a dog at a nearby village. He was pursued by the people he had stolen from. The matter was able to be settled peacefully, and the people brought more food for them the next day. They worked on repairing their barge, but when attempting to take it out to sea, once again, it capsized and was lost, along with two men. Among the items lost on the barge was most of the men's clothing. Devaka puts their state at this point as such. Quote, we lost only those the barge took down, but the survivors escaped as naked as they were born. With the loss of everything we had, that was not much, but valuable to us in that bitter November cold. Our bodies so emaciated we could easily count every bone and look at the picture of death. But luckily they were taken in by the people of the island. During this time, survivors from two of the other barges arrived on Galveston. To try and save the remaining men, they found four strong swimmers and sent them out from Galveston Island, to try and get help from the Spanish, which they still thought were pretty much over the next hill. At this point, some of the diseases the men were suffering from spread to the natives they were staying with. Spanish took to calling this island Isla de Malado, or the Island of Doom, or Island of Misfortune, depending on how dramatic you want to be. The natives of, that the Spanish were staying with only lived here seasonally, collecting roots and fish during the winter and living on the mainland the rest of the year. At this point, Devaca begins to mention becoming a faith healer to survive. Some of the Spanish would bribe another native with some items they had stolen during one of their earlier adventures to get them off the island. At this point, Devaca had fallen deathly ill, and they pretended to be visiting him before escaping. Only two others were forced to or chose to stay behind. While the exact details are not recorded in the report, Devaca and the other Spanish became slaves at this point, being harshly treated by the people they were staying with. Moving into 1530, however, Devaca was able to become a traitor, thanks to his neutral affiliation with the tribes in the area. This allowed him to move freely throughout the area. They believe he got as far as Oklahoma. He would stay in this state until 1532, trying to plan his escape, as well as that of the lone remaining other Spaniard he knew of. This Spaniard, Lopez de Oviedo, who would continuously insist they'd leave the next year, and when the time finally arrived, he'd demur until the next year until finally agreeing to go with Cabeza de Vaca in 1532. Shortly after leaving Galveston Island, the Spanish learned that at least three others were alive and soon to be in the area. They decided to wait for the other three before continuing on. Oviedo would return to the island at this time and drop out of the narrative. The other three survivors would finally arrive. Alonso de Castillo and a Moorish slave, Esteban, came with one group, and Andreas Dorantes with another. As a note, Esteban is called by several other names depending on the translation, including Esteban, Estebanico, Estevanico, and Stephen. The eco nicknames, which could be roughly translated as the equivalent of Stevie in English, are considered to have been insulting and diminutive nicknames. Devaca manages to meet with all three, and they plan their escape in six months, when they would be able to travel with a different group. Devaca would end up traveling with the same group as Durantes. They would travel some 100 miles to Matagorda Bay. Here they would meet up with one of the four who had swam from the island, Matagorda Bay being as far as the swimmers had been able to make it. It was here they found out what happened to Narvaez himself. Back in 1528, one of the barges had capsized near a river and had been lost. When Narvaez's barge had arrived, they traveled along the shore while his party remained in the barge, but nearby. One night, a strong wind took the barge out to sea and it was never seen again. Some have suggested that Narvaez had abandoned the men on the shore altogether. There is no way of knowing for sure, as this was the last recorded sighting of the leader of the expedition, and we only have the story that Devaca claims he was told by a removed source. Those left behind by Narvaez made it to San Antonio Bay where infighting began, and in their hunger, the men resorted to cannibalism. One of these men survived to march, where he was killed trying to flee the natives that had discovered him, and were horrified by what he and his companions had been forced to resort to. Presumably, the, this group that found this man heard the story, passed, and it had been passed on to the Spaniard. Returning to 1533, some of the Spaniards were turned out due to lack of food and left to fend for themselves. Most of this group that was turned out would be split up and perish, some trying to escape. Four even falling would also get caught up in all of this, but would manage to survive. Far four heroes, the six months passed as planned. But due to fighting between the two groups that had them, they had to wait another year. The plan was to escape on the new moon of August 29th, although the actual date of the new moon was about a week later than their planned date, showing that Cabeza de Vaca's calendar may have been slightly off, which is not too surprising considering the hardships the men had endured to this point and the lack of accurate timekeeping tools that they had access to. Cabeza de Vaca had promised the other three that he would wait at the appointed spot until the full moon before continuing onwards. After about two weeks of waiting, Dorantes and his slave Esteban would arrive. Here they would learn that the last barge had capsized nearby and all the men had died. Shortly thereafter, they were able to meet up with Castillo. Now all four were traveling with the same group. After conferring with this more friendly group, they learned that there would be little food if they left immediately. Instead, they decided to spend the winter with them. 
during which time they worked mostly as healers. Cabeza de Vaca got lost at one point during this stay and nearly died. It is here where they begin to move further west that I want to leave Cabeza de Vaca. A map of this expedition is available at the website and in the show notes. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice if it lets you. Since I'm a Luddite and don't use social media, word of mouth and reviews are the only way the show spreads. We have a website located at engineeringfire.org. That's spelled E-N-G-I-N-E-E-R-I-N-G-F-I-R-E dot org, where I have a link in the header for podcast resources, including pictures, companion posts, my bibliography, and the transcripts of each show. We have an email you can submit comments and questions to at michael at engineeringfire.org. The intro music is Desperados by Frank Schroeder and sourced from filmmusic.io. The outro music is Neo Western from Kevin McLeod of Incompetech. Links to all things mentioned are present in the show notes and at the website. Thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.